plus structural processing. This is going to be the first in a series of two lectures. Uh, the first part, uh, in the first part, we are going to discuss the psychological reality of syntactic structure. Uh, we have two types of information to discuss. The first is the clause as a processing unit, and we are go going to discuss uh, structural ambiguity. In the second part of today's lecture, we're going to discuss building structure. We're going to discuss the parser and its properties. We're going to discuss fillers and gaps. Here we have a tiny mistake, which I'm going to edit. So we're going to discuss gaps and fillers. All right, the third thing is pronominal reference. We're going to discuss these in detail in today's lecture. So let's start with the first part of today's lecture, the psychological reality of syntactic structure. As you know, if you have already studied syntax, you must have been exposed to this information. Language can be, or the linguistic uh, information can be divided, can be categorized. There are noun phrases and there are verb phrases. There are adjective phrases. As you are listening to someone, you, the, the, the person you are listening to does not inform you, does not tell you uh, that this is a noun phrase and that this is a verb phrase and this is an adjective phrase. What happens is he throws words on you and as you are listening to this person, you are analyzing his speech or her speech and categorize it inside your mind, categorize it according to uh, to the set of words, whether it is a noun phrase, a verb phrase, an adjective phrase, or an adverbial phrase. So this is a, a process which happens inside your mind. So syntactic units, for example, subject, subject noun phrase, and predicate verb phrase, are not labeled as such in the signal. What, what happens when you hear someone, you know, when you are listening to someone, what happens is you are just listening to a set of words which are not labeled as noun phrase or verb phrase. Yet psycholinguists think that uh, hearers are uh, systematically compute syntactic structure while processing sentences, as illustrated below. So what happens if you read it from right to left? Perhaps you are familiar with this uh, picture, if you have already seen previous lectures. We have uh, had this illustration before. What happens as you are listening to someone is just you, you are receiving auditory system. You are just receiving sound. This sound is not labeled as noun phrases or verb phrases. It is just set of words. Word following another word. What happens inside your mind, as you can see in this, uh, in this box, inside this box, what happens inside your mind is that you are computing the uh, linguistic information. You are translating the sound into a representation inside your mind. You have phonological representation, you have lexical selection, you have syntactic representation. You divide the speech you are listening to. You divide it as you are listening. This happens so quickly. As you are listening to someone, you are categorizing the sentence. You are dividing the sentence into smaller parts. Noun phrase, as you can see in this tree, on the far left, on this tree diagram, the sentence is categorized, is labeled. This is a process which happens inside your mind as you are listening. You label the sentence you are listening to as noun phrase, verb phrase, etc. Okay? So this is part of the psychological reality of syntactic structure. As you are listening, you are categorizing the speech you are listening to. Another fact about the psychological reality of syntactic structure is that the clause is a processing unit. Um, I guess you already know the word clause. If not, um, the clause is, uh, is a smaller part of the sentence. Sometimes it is dependent, dependent clause, and, some, um, so, and sometimes it is independent clause. Uh, if you don't know the difference between dependent uh, clause and independent clause, please go back to uh, uh, grammar books and uh, your grammar books and uh, 
revise this because this is necessary for you to, un to understand today's lecture. Um, perhaps you are not going to, to understand today's lecture and it's going to take a lot of time to explain these two types of, clo of clauses and I'm not going to explain them now. I'm going to leave this for you to go back to your grammar books and revise the, uh, what is meant by the word close. This is not a grammar uh, course, this is a psycholinguistics uh, course. Uh, so um, let's go back to uh, today's uh, lecture. A close is a processing unit. The speech can be divided into clauses and there is a closed boundary. This is something inside your mind. You are not uh, looking at the or listening to the closed boundary. What you hear is just the signal, the sound, the set of words following each other. You and it is your it is the job of your mind to to have boundaries between words. Closed boundary is the location where a new clause begins. Let's compare these two sentences. In her hope of marrying, Anna was surely impractical. Okay, here we have a closed boundary. Your hope of marrying Anna was surely impractical. So as you are listening, your mind cuts the received auditory input into clauses or segments. This process helps you understand the auditory signal. So let's suppose that you are listening to someone. He says, in her hope of marrying Anna, and you have, in her hope of marrying, Anna was surely impractical. So this is um, uh, taken from a long text, or from, from a long speech. And what you are doing now is cutting it into segments, closes. In her, in her hope of marrying, Anna was surely impractical. Let's try it without any closed boundaries. In her, in her hope of marrying, Anna was surely impractical. This is not easy to understand because we did not have the closed boundaries. Okay? Let's take the second one. Your hope of marrying Anna was surely impractical. This is difficult to understand. But if we have the closed boundary, it is going to be a lot more easy to understand. Your hope of marrying Anna was surely impractical. Okay? If you compare the two ways in which I read these two sentences, you are going to, to uh, understand what I am trying to say. As we are listening, we are trying to have closed boundaries. These closed boundaries help us understand the text we are listening to. The uh, third thing we are going to discuss now is structural ambiguity. The meaning of structural ambiguity, the, the meaning of the term ambiguity. Ambiguity is the noun, ambiguous is the adjective. Structural ambiguity is uh, having one sentence which has more than one meaning. This often happens, that sometimes we have a sentence which has more than one meaning. The same sentence can have more than one meaning. Let's have this example. The man saw the boy with the binoculars. This sentence has two meanings. It can either mean the boy is carrying binoculars and the man saw him. Okay, so the man saw a boy. This boy was carrying binoculars. This is the first meaning. The second meaning for the same sentence, for this ambiguous sentence is the man saw the boy using binoculars. So this time the man is having binoculars. He put the binoculars on, al minzar He took the binoculars on and saw the boy. So we can see here, we can see one sentence. And this sentence has two meanings. Okay, this is called structural ambiguity. An ambiguous sentence can be disambiguated when put into context. So if you put an, uh, an ambiguous sentence into context, it is going to be easy to disambiguate it, to know what one of the multiple meanings the same this sentence has. Okay?
During the process of perception, the brain works like a parser. So this is the second element for today, building structure. So as you are listening, you are creating. As if you, if you, if you look at the if you look at the uh, picture we had already, this is what happens inside your mind. This is called parsing. You are building a structure as you are listening. So here you receive an auditory signal. If you if, if we, uh, look at the the person speaking on the right, he's giving an auditory system. And what happens inside your mind is you are, is that you are parsing. You are building structure. All right. Parsing is the mental process of building syntactic structure out of the linear set of words during listening to texts. This parser, which is a property of your mind, okay, this parser has properties. It has many properties. First is, it prefers simple structures. So your brain, as you are listening to people, you always prefer simple structures. There are simple sentences and there are complex sentences, subordinate sentences and coordinate sentences. These two, these two types of sentences are a bit difficult to analyze for the parser. Your parser always prefers simple structures. Your parser also computes relationships between words both rapidly and efficiently. The parser breaks down complex sentences to simpler sentences. This makes the process of understanding speech uh, a lot more easier. This is one of the things you do as you are listening to people. Okay. The fourth thing is that the parser responds differently to morphosyntactic violations. For example, when you are listening to someone and he made a, a syntactic mistake, for example, the, the person you are listening to said, I watched many people, they is crazy. Okay? So, here we have a syntactic error. The speaker used the singular uh, as instead of are. So as you are listening to this person who made this syntactic mistake, your brain is going to respond differently. It's going to stop for a moment. Okay, this is going to a bit. Uh, this is going to uh, cause a, dif uh, the, a difficulty for the parser. This is going to difficult to cause a difficulty for your brain as it analyzes the speech. Your brain is going to have some pause and uh, a bit uh, a bit of uh, an effort to analyze this text or, or this spoken text okay so this is the parser and these are the properties of the parser in building structure we have two things gaps and fillers uh, perhaps, as you know, okay, how it looks better. All right, now it looks better. Here, what happened is. We have a filler and a gap. What is the difference between these two types of syntactic elements? One function of the syntax of syntax is to move elements of a sentence around. For example, while making questions, you are make, you are moving elements. Okay? An element that has been moved is called a filler. After it has been moved, it has left a gap in its original position. Let's look at the illustration here we have here. Mike drove the red car. This is a sentence. 
Mike drove the red car. When forming a question, we have some movement. It has jingled up. Uh, we have some movement. We have the red car. It has been moved to the beginning of the sentence. Okay. And it has left a gap. So which car is the fella? Because it has been moved. If we ignore the arrows because I think they are making it a bit more difficult to understand what we have here. So if we uh, remove the arrows, I think it is going to be a lot easier to understand. So here we have the sentence, Mike drove the red car. The red car has been moved to the beginning of the sentence in order to form a question. Which car is called the fella? And the space left is called gap. Okay, so these two types of syntactic elements, what happens inside your brain as you are listening to someone? In order to create structures that represent sent sentence meaning, when it encounters a fella, the parser must identify the location of its gap. So let's suppose that you listen to someone, he's asking, which car did Mike drive? Your brain quick, uh, quickly puts the fella back to, its, to, to the gap. So the brain, in order to understand the, the sentence, the brain puts the uh, fella back to, to its normal position so that, the, so that you understand what happened there, so that you understand the question. Your parser identifies the location of the gap. It has to know the part where which part of the sentence is the is the gap. Okay. The last thing we are going to discuss today is pronominal reference. Pronouns refer to noun phrases. So this is a fact. Pronouns always refer to noun phrases. The job of the parser is to locate which noun phrase these, no these pronouns refer to. Let's look at the example we have here. The teacher saw the student and asked him to do an extra homework. The teacher saw the student and asked him, and asked him to do an extra homework. As you are listening to the sentence, let's ignore the colors for now. I, made the, I just uh, had the colors in order. Uh, just to show the labels, as you are listening, you are, you are not going to, to look at colors. There are no colors in the speech. You are just listening to, to, to sound. Okay, let's uh, suppose that you are listening to this uh, sentence. The teacher saw the student and asked him to do an extra homework. Here we have, at the end of this, no, near the end of the sentence, we have a pronoun, him. We have an object pronoun, and they asked him to do an extra homework. Your parser has to decide. In order to understand the sentence, your parser has to decide the pronominal reference. What, what does the, this pronoun refer to? It can either refer to the, the student or the teacher. If, you, if, you, if the parser thought that him refers to the teacher, the sentence is going to be meaningless. If the parser understands that him refers to the student, the sentence is going to be meaningful. So as you are listening, the parser, your parser, which is inside your brain, puts back every pronoun to its, uh, or relates every pronoun to the noun phrase. Here we have a noun phrase, the student, and the pronoun. Him. Your brain, the parser, has to relate all pronouns to, the, to their noun phrases. Okay. Let's do the exercise together. The parser computes relations between words. The parser prefers simple structures. Or the, the parser responds to morphosyntactic violations differently. Or all of the previous items are correct. The answer is D. When the, prop, the, the parser has all these three properties and more. If you look at here the, the properties of the parser, 
we have all these properties in the question, in the exercise. So the answer is D because the parser has all these three properties and more. Thanks very much for listening.